Hi, my name is Pat Forte. I've been a member of the Bill Boo Writers Workshop for several years now. Um, this is a story, it's really an outline that I wrote about three years ago and I was going through some paperwork a couple of days ago and I saw it and I thought I would use it for a story that we're using for a, some, a homework assignment. And the homework assignment is to write a story based upon a seven word short story. And mine was entitled, one of the short stories was entitled, Don't Envy the Other Person's Journey. So this is a story called 83 Cents. 83 Cents is an actual woman. She is a fixture in our neighborhood. Well, she used to be a fixture in our neighborhood. I don't know where she is now. But they did call her 83 Cents. I don't know if you remember that or not, Destiny. I remember. Yeah, there was a lady called 83 Cents. I don't know why she was called 83 Cents, but this is my version. <clears throat> 83 Cents, an African-American woman, now in her 60s, had a reputation throughout the neighborhood as a washed-up wino. No, a washed-up bureau. You see, this woman was known for her infamous request outside the liquor store. Say, my friend, you got 83 Cents? I like the way you're sporting that hat this fine morning. Look, I need to get me a taste. You know how it is. A taste of old English was sure enough put a smile on my face. She became known as 83 cents because that was the exact amount she would ask for when she asked for her fix, a six ounce can of Old English 800. Life was good for Estelle back in the day. From the mid 70s to the early 80s, her life blossomed. She married a stand up guy named Raymond Jenkins. They had three beautiful children, Ray Jr., Bonnie, and little Michaela. Estelle adored her children. She even got a job as a teacher's aide at the children's elementary school. Raymond worked at the oil refinery in Long Beach. She and Raymond worked hard and eventually bought a lovely two-bedroom home in the neighborhood. Life was sweet. Estelle was a looker in her prime. Her admirers, and there were many, called her Stella by Starlight, an homage to the popular jazz song back in the day. Caramel brown skin covered her shapely five feet, uh, eight inches frame, and she knew how to move those curvy hips when she passed the opposite sex. She knew when to laugh, she knew when to smile. She knew how to be demure if the situation called for it. She knew how to measure a person up and get what she wanted. These days, 83 cents could be seen riding up and down the street in her old beat up tread bare black Buick. She had plenty of time on her hands and no place to go since the school laid her off a few years back. Neighbors reasoned that she may be sleeping in her car since she could only be seen in the morning since she could be seen early in the morning and late at night driving up and down the street. Or she could be found parked outside her favorite liquor store, waiting for sponsors to buy her a beer. Mm -hmm. Many days she would wear her tattered house coat all day. Some days she didn't feel like combing her hair. But regardless of her appearance, she always had a cheerful word for her sponsors. 83 cents had her game down pat. She would park and check out the customers entering the liquor store. She would then get out and stand beside the car and wait for them to come out. Some folks would hurry past her to avoid eye contact. Other folks would stop and listen to what she had to say. She knew how to approach her prey. She studied them. You might hear her say, you're looking awfully nice this morning, my sister. Noticing the car seat in the, in the car, she would say, on your way to work? I know you probably got kids, so I ain't gonna ask for much. You got 83 cents so I can get my day started, girlfriend. I could sure use a taste. Or you might hear something like, save my brother, help a sister out. I had a rough night. You know how it goes. Times are rough out here. You got 83 cents to keep the hates off. One day, a young college girl named Destiny, home for the holidays, is approached by 83 cents. Save my little school girl. You wanna help your community? You can help by giving me 83 cents to get rid of these shakes. I wanna thank you. Miller Brewing Company wants to thank you. Destiny smiled and gave her 51 cents. That's all she had. When Destiny got home, she asked her father and his pool playing partner about this strange woman at the liquor store who asked people for 83 cents. Oh, that's 83 cents. We all call her that. She ain't gonna hurt you. She just got, she just a pitiful old woman. Don't pay her no mind. But why does she ask for why doesn't she ask for maybe a dollar or even 50 cents? or even maybe just ask for change. 
Why does she always ask for 83 cents? That's cause she's nuts. We all know that. Just walk past her if she makes you uncomfortable. Pay her no mind. Destiny's father and his friend laughed and joked a while about 83 cents and her, and her unusual tactics. The next day, Destiny went back to the liquor store to see 83 cents. There she was getting sponsors for her habit. Destiny decided to approach her first this time. Ma'am, can I have a word with you? It won't take a minute. Hell no, you can't have no word with me. Uh, don't feel sorry for me, little mama. I don't have time for pity. I don't need no lecture. I don't need no counseling. And she walked away. The next day, Destiny went inside the liquor store and purchased a 16 ounce can of Old English. She anxiously went outside and handed her the bag. Here you go. Thank you very much for your contribution, little mama. She got her beer, put it in her Buick, and went on about her daily hustle. Destiny watched her as she approached a young Hispanic man coming out of the liquor store. Hola, amigo. Como esta? Usted a boy a trabajar hoy? He didn't answer. Usted tiene 83 centavos, mi amigo? Por favor, por favor. The young man gave her two quarters before he got into his pickup truck full of landscaping equipment. He even smiled as he drove off. Oh, adios, amigo, she said as she looked around for the next sponsor. Destiny decided to try her luck again. Ma'am, can I just have a few words with you? No, you may not, little mama. I don't need no do-gooders in my life. I know how to get my hustle on. Apparently, you don't. Uh, what do you mean by that? Very patiently, she explained herself. If you knew how to hustle, you would not keep asking permission to get what you want. Oh, uh, okay, look, <clears throat> maybe I went about it the wrong way, my bad. <clears throat> I'm new at this. I'll have to turn a short paper in on, on a black hero uh, when I get back to school, and I've chosen you as my hero. I really think you're pretty cool. Won't you talk to me? Not bad, little mama, not bad. Any good salesperson know that you must find out what your customer wants and give it to them. Watch and learn, my little chickadee. Watch and learn. 83 Cent spotted a middle-aged black woman hurrying into the liquor store. She was well-dressed, wearing an expensive gray suit. That sister is in a hurry to get to her 9 to 5. You can tell she's a professional, so you can't waste her time. There's no ring on her finger, so she's probably trying to catch a man. Respect her time, compliment her, with her, you have to hit it and quit it. She'll feel good about herself, you'll get your money. Miller Brewing Company gets its money. It's a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. 83 cents approached the woman as she exited the store. You look like a million dollars today, ma'am. I know you're busy, so I won't waste your time. I just need 83 cents to help me get through this morning. I can see you're a busy woman. The lady smiled and handed her the change um, that she had in her hands. Thank you, ma'am. Now you go and you set the world on fire. The lady laughed as she got into her car. 83 cents, I mean, Destiny offered 83 cents a deal. You give me a few minutes of your time and I'll give you uh, $5, that's all I have. Step into my office and let's see what we can come up with, little mama. Inside the car, Destiny took out her pad and pencil. You came prepared, I like that. Have faith in yourself, that's good. Now, what do you need for your paper? I don't have all day. Okay, <clears throat> why does everybody call you 83 cents? Well, <clears throat> here it is in a nutshell. I used to have a good life. I was married with three kids and lived in a beautiful home. My house burned down in 1983, okay? My son died in that fire. My two little girls, girls were taken from me and my husband because we couldn't take care of them. We became homeless. My baby, <clears throat> my baby girls are still in separate foster homes. My husband Ray drank himself to death. So I figured 83 was the year my pain started. If I could get enough 83 cents, I just might could turn the situation around and ease my pain. Old English does a good job in helping me relieve my pain. Sounds crazy, I know. Folks say I'm crazy, but I'm still in the race. I haven't killed myself. I haven't turned no tricks. I haven't used no heavy drugs. I'm still in the race. I may not finish first, I know that. But I intend to finish. Is that enough for your paper, little mama? 
if I can get $5 from my dad, can we talk tomorrow? We'll see, little mama, we'll see. Destiny tried to give her a hug when she was leaving the car, but 83 cents pulled away. See you tomorrow, 83 cents. And I'm glad you're still in the race. See you tomorrow, little mama. I'll see you tomorrow. And <laughs> So uh, I was supposed to have my homework ready, so somehow or another I got it together today. <laughs> okay. You know that last minute stuff. <laughs> okay. um, I recently retired from the Department of Justice and I'm trained to be a personal trainer. And I do about 300 sit-ups every morning. And I um, want to get back to track. Not low hurdles, I'm going to do low hurdles, but back to track. <laughs> okay. All right. My story is... Nanny Hattie. And it's about a little girl and her grandmother and their interaction. And the little girl has just started school. Well, she's really in the first grade. And school can be kind of rough and kind of hard, because especially if you have the wrong name. You know, you can be Mary, Jane, Cool, you know, Latasha, Cool. But Hattie, Hattie's an old fashioned name. So, into the scene with baby girl hat. Oh, oh, Grandma, Grandma, I don't want to go back to school. No, no, I don't want to go back to school. Grandma, come here, child. Tell Grandma what's the problem. Why don't my girl want to go to school? Baby girl, they laugh at me. They laugh at my name. Grandma, what do you mean they laugh at you and your name? Baby girl. They said I don't have a real name. I have an old name. They say I'm a hat. I'm not a girl. Grandma, let me tell you about your name. You're named after your great great grandma, Hattie McDaniel. Baby girl. Her name was Hattie McDaniel? Grandma, yes, my Hattie. We call you baby girl. But I think we'll start calling you by your real name because you should be proud of your name. It's important to know who you are and who you're named after. Baby girl stopped crying and started listening intently to Grandma. Grandma, <coughs> once upon a time, a sweet little girl was born to a Susan Holbrook, who was her mother, and her father, his name was Henry McDaniel, both her mother and father were former slaves. Her father fought in the Civil War and her, and her mother sang religious songs. Well, Hattie learned how to be a songwriter and as well as a performer. She sang in her brother's minstrel show. I'll tell you about minstrel shows later. Sometimes Hattie had to work as a maid in a washroom attendant. Whatever Hattie did, she took pride in it. That means she did her best. Whatever she could do, she did her best. Thank you. Is that why you tell me to do my best? Yes, Hattie, that, Grandma. <laughs> yes, Hattie, that is part of the reason. Baby girl, tell me more about Hattie with that. Grandma, well, I can only tell you something. You'll learn more as you get older. Baby girl, I want to know more, so I won't cry when they laugh at me. I will tell them I'm named after my great-great-grandma, who was a very special woman. Grandma. Okay, let me tell you just a few things. Hattie McDaniel was, a, was very accomplished. Your Hattie was an actress, a singer, a songwriter, and a comedian. She has two stars on the Hollywood Walk of Fame in Hollywood. One is for the work she did in radio, and the other for acting in motion pictures. She has two stars? She was an actor too? Grandma, yes, Hattie. 
She was the first African American that won an Oscar and was inducted into the Black Filmmakers Hall of Fame. And guess what? In 2006, she became the first African American to be honored with a U.S. postage stamp. Little Hattie, I'm going to the A.C. Bill Brew Library and read us a copy of Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. My girl, it's going to be just wonderful looking at her on film again. Baby girl. Grandma, you mean I can see my great-great-grandmother in a movie? Grandma. Hattie girl, even more than that, I'm going to teach you what Hattie McDaniel said when she won the Oscar. You will memorize the words so they will always help you love your name and the woman you are named after. So Hattie said, Academy of, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Science, fellow members of the motion picture industry and honored guests, this is one of the happiest moments of my life. And I want to thank each one of you who had a part in selecting me for one of their awards. For your kindness, it has made me feel very, very humble. And I shall always hold it as a beacon for anything that I may be able to do in the future. I sincerely hope I shall always be a credit to my race and to the motion picture industry. My heart is too full to tell you just how I feel. And I may, and may I say, thank you and God bless you. So, Hattie, baby girl, looks at Grandma and she says, thank you, Grandma. I need to go back to school. And that's Hattie. Johnson. I have been in the Bill Group Writers Group now for a few months, and since I've been doing this, I, um, I don't come here just because it's a writing group, but it's a way for me to really get my story out. On today, I want to show a little bit of my versatility. Um, as I've explained in the past, some of my writing deals a lot with what I went through with childhood, but then there's another part of my writing that kind of always writes about the silver lining at the end of a story. Um, so this next piece is called Faith Versus Doubt, and what I did is I gave faith and doubt human emotions, and as you hear it, let it lead you in your faith versus your doubt. Faith and doubt was driving in a car on a one-way road, in the middle of what seemed like nowhere. Faith began to tell doubt, I know it's another road somewhere. My father told me so. Doubt began to mock Faith by saying, you don't know what you're talking about, Faith. Faith is nowhere in sight, but doubt is everywhere. Look around, we're on a one-way road. Doubt is driving now, sit back, relax. There's no exits out here on this road of doubt. Doubt further replied, in fact, I'm positive there are no other roads. I'm extremely versed in fear and doubt, for my father is the father of doubt. Now, faith, this father you're talking about, are you saying that your father is the father of faith? <laughs> faith replied, yes, and he's given me a measure of faith. So although this road is dark and dingy and bumpy with potholes, my faith tells me that just over that little hill, there's a turnoff called faith, and I'm going to get there. So, I guess, well no, I get through the rough parts. I'll brace myself for the potholes. I can't see Faith Road yet, but I know it's there. It's impossible for my father to fail. My faith, although small, won't let me doubt for too long. It's what I can't see that leads me doubt. 
Doubt didn't agree with any of her makeup. My father told me that everything I needed was, everything that I needed was inside of me to succeed. My father also told me to believe the opposite of what doubt had ever told me. So I know for sure there's a turnoff just beyond that pothole because doubt said it wasn't. Doubt began to say, but how are you gonna get out of the car? If you haven't noticed faith, I, doubt, have been driving for a long time. I am in full control. And besides, if your father is so great, where is he? Faith! Uh, like I thought so, I don't see him. You, is he there? You and I are the only two passengers in this car. Brace yourself, Faith, here comes a big pothole and I'm not going to slow down. In fact, I think I'll accelerate at full speed. Doubt began to tease and mock Faith. Where is your father, Faith? Can he smooth the rough edges? Can he fill in the potholes with this measure of faith that you're talking about? How much did this faith cost you? Where'd you get it from? What does it look like? What does it make you feel like on the inside, Faith? What is it made of? Can it float you over this hill of doubt? Can it take you through the valley of indecision and get you through the water of worry? Doubt is like an anchor, Faith. I weigh you down. So I hope this measure of faith that you're constantly talking about can, can lift the anchor of doubt. Doubt thought that he was instilling fear in faith with all of his ranting and raving. But faith just smiled and said, thank you, doubt. I see my turn off now. Your doubt became my exit. Faith cancels out doubt. My vision is getting clearer now. I can see the role. Oh, oh, and there's my father. Do you, you see him, doubt? Do you see him? At that moment, the father of faith snatched her up out of the car of doubt and placed her in the road of faith. Doubt continued to aimlessly drive looking for faith's exit, but he couldn't see the road. He no longer had faith in the car to fuel his doubt. Doubt no longer nursed faith's fears. Doubt no longer had control over faith's mind. Faith's anchor of worry no longer anchored doubt's fears. Doubt no longer had control over faith's mind. And now, faith's anchor of worry no longer anchored doubt's ship. Doubt was defeated over and over again. Never again was he even thought of in faith's mind. Doubt couldn't even trick faith anymore. He no longer could hold her hostage with his restraints. Doubt couldn't even compete against the makeups of faith. Faith just simply thought in her mind, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unseen. My name is Odie Hawkins, and I have the pleasure uh, of being the leader of the Billboard Writers Workshop. And uh, we've been having so much fun lately, I hardly know how to begin this. Uh, I was told I should say something about myself and what it is I've been doing. I decided to do it this way. I write books, and currently I have about 40 of these books under different, in different genres. <clears throat> My friends have uh, nicknamed me the Underground Master because uh, the fact that I'm well known but not well known. The people who uh, know what I write know what I write. One of the things that can happen on the business level if you write books, is that uh, publishers like you to stick with one genre. Uh, I thought that was nonsense in the beginning, I still do, so I write whatever I feel like I want to write in whatever genre I'm capable of writing in. Uh, what I'll do eventually, when I get around to it in the next five minutes, is to read from one of these books 
this one, but first let me explain a little bit about what each one of them has in it. This is a book uh, about a man who has had a severe mental illness, schizophrenia, uh, paranoid schizophrenia, and so forth and so on. Very interesting guy, he's about 6'8". He spent about 20 some years uh, on the sidewalk right in front of the Department of Justice on Spring Street. Uh, my wife became one of his best friends, very interesting couple, he's 6'8", and she's 4'9". Four, four but he was a very gentle giant. He was a very gentle giant who would uh, ask her to do things like, uh, Miss Hawkins, would you, <clears throat> would you buy me a cup of espresso? He drank espresso, but he didn't take a bath, so you could sense where he was about 10 yards away. And periodically he would disappear and so forth and so on. The story I decided to write, I'll call it Kwanzaa for Conrad and the Survival Tango. The story I decided to write was about a man who had uh, existed on the street for 25 years and eventually had his schizophrenia go into remission to the point where he became a best-selling author. I have a schizophrenic daughter uh, and it, uh, it's a very strange kind of illness because it can, it can blow up fully and then disappear or recede. So in her case, it seems to have receded. Uh, Quantum of Conrad. The Palm Wine Junction, the Palm Wine Junction is a, a series of short stories. I went to Ghana in 1992 because I got tired of living in America. Uh, but you can't get away from it, it's everywhere these <laughs> days. So, so, anyway, I went to Ghana and I had a little house built on a section of Accra called Palm Wine Junction. Mm -hmm. And some of the stories that take place in this book come from that area. Very interesting place, Palm Wine Junction. Very interesting. I'll read from that one. I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's an aerospace engineer about what's going to happen in aerospace. He says, okay, uh, they're going to begin to have long duration missions. And since most of the space, uh, the astronauts have been men, what will be happening with these men? He asked me. I didn't know. He said, well, they will be missing sex. And you can't mentally, I mean, uh, chemically castrate them to the point where they will miss that. So uh, that's what's going to be a big problem. They haven't addressed this problem openly, but we know that it's there. He came up with the suggestion that they have a woman uh, accompany seven astronauts. The woman would not be a prostitute. She wouldn't be a comfort woman. She would be something, someone who would accommodate each one of these men as a wife in space. It would be like if you went to your hotel room and you had your card, punched the card in, that's your room entrance. So in this case, each one of these men would have a card that would give him the woman that he wanted. The wow. Chinese, the Chinese, the Chinese uh, astronaut wanted a Chinese woman, got one. The Native American guy wanted a Sioux woman, got one. The black man wanted an African queen, got one. And uh, at the end of the day, Aerospace Control decided that they did not want to have these men come back or have this woman come to Earth because she would spoil everything. So they decided, they made decisions like this, they decided to blow the ship up and get rid of everybody in order to squash the story. This is not a true story, please. <laughs> but they didn't, they didn't, the lady's name is Bliss. They decided uh, Lady Bliss would be uh, shuttled out in space and she drifts off into something like the uh, ocean current out in the galaxy and winds up on an unknown planet called Aziz. 
On our Z, men have babies by cesarean section. Uh, everything is turned upside down and made right in the way that we don't have things made right here. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to tell you anything about the current news. We know what's happening, so that everything that we can think of, with the exception of uh, Karen Johnson's story, everything is going wrong, but it's going right here. So Lady Bliss is out there, and uh, the space program is suffering as a result. <clears throat> Zola Selena Hawkins says, well, hey, look, buddy, since you've given these seven men an opportunity to have seven wives, what's going to happen when they send seven astronauts, female astronauts, out into space? What are they going to do? They will have a, a, a male, a male Mr. Beats. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. So she decided that it would be a good idea, I agreed with her, that the, these seven women would have a man who would accompany them, who would accommodate, dig it? Each one of them would accommodate <laughs> each one of the, 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 the ladies. Uh, the, uh, the Jewish woman, one of the Jewish guys. So she gets it. Anyway, the character that I came up with was, I'm calling him Mr. Bonneville Bliss. The early lady, Lady Bliss. Lady Bliss is what that was. As you all know, the Bonneville monkeys are one of the few primates who have sex facing each other. Most primates do it from the rear. So here they are with Mr. Bonneville Bliss, who has to keep his sexual equipment well oiled and prepared to be of use frequently because he's with seven ladies in space. They, in this case, they all return to space, but they suffer from uh, romantic post-stress, romantic disorder because they've been in space with a man who was able to furnish them with whatever they needed emotionally and physically so here they are back with just us ordinary guys. <laughs> and as a consequence, <laughs> you laugh, it happens. As a consequence, they wind up being treated for uh, various uh, psychological ailments and so forth. Never quite recovered. Bonneville bliss. That's not a good testimony to the man. <laughs> I got to get your name and, and your age. I got to get your age. Uh, Black Chicago, you know where Black Chicago is? It's in Chicago. Okay. <clears throat> Black Chicago is a story about several things. One of them is a, a school teacher I had named Dr. Marwin Burroughs. As a high school student, I was a uh, bad boy. And she saved my life in many ways by giving me a, a ream of paper to write on and say, you know, hey, they, you don't have to go to jail. You can, you can become something better than that. In addition, that Chicago was settled initially by a black man named Jean Baptiste Point du Sable which means that the city should have been named Dusaba City. Mm -hmm. Dr. Marbury Burroughs uh, petitioned and, and, and argued all the life for the change of Chicago to Dusaba City. She didn't succeed, but what she did do was open up a museum. She had a museum open, the Dusaba Museum of African American History, mm -hmm. which was the first in the United States. Oh, wow. And I'm really sometimes disappointed that that's not a better known thing. Yeah. I went to Afro Am here, incidentally, to ask them some questions about what they knew about Dr. Margaret Byrd. Mm -hmm. the, I don't want to say everybody was in the same boat, but the person I talked to had never heard of her. Oh, wow. Wow. Anyway, uh, this is the front of her apartment. She lived at 3806 Michigan Avenue. And I used to go there very frequently to get advice. Uh, school teachers, especially, uh, uh, prize items on this planet because 
They can do things to solve problems for you. They can uh, take you onward and outward. And I don't know why they're not giving more credit and better pay. But that was Dr. Burroughs. Shackles across time. The cover itself was drawn by uh, a woman named Zola Selena Hawkins, who's a good friend of mine. <laughs> She loans me money sometimes. <laughs> Quarter of a dollar. Anyway, uh, the story basically is about the role that Africans played in the African slave trade. One of the reasons why I went to Ghana was to do research on what part uh, Africans played. Hey, hey, what you doing? You. You talking to yourself? You can't do that. I was, I was oh, thinking, I see. Okay. I was trying to down so that I guess. I, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, not a lot of attention has been uh, historically has been directed at the at the role that Africans played in the African slave trade. Uh, I was teaching at a girls' academy at a, the uh, Akar Girls Secondary School. And I asked the question one day, you know, what do you know about African-American, African-American history? It took two days for uh, Fatima to come to class to show me uh, a quotation from a book that said, in many centuries ago, uh, many Africans left their continent to go to the new world to help build it up. That was her interpretation of slavery. The book was written by some Englishman, but when people start talking about the, the need for African-American history and so forth and so on, there's a crying need for African-American history to be taught in Africa too, having said that. Uh, the photo here, what you look at is the, is the, uh, the talents of a very talented lady. She draws, and this photograph was taken of a friend of ours named Bahati. Uh, the snake doctor, I'll tell you about what the snake doctor is about in a moment after talking about the picture. I wanted to have a picture of a, of a, a black Tarzan, and Bahati was nearby, and Zola said, Bahati, stand up against that tree and take off his shirt. And of course, he was afraid of her and, <laughs> and stood over against the tree and took off his shirt the way he was supposed to. So we got an iconic photograph. Uh, the book is selling quite well because of Bahati, not a light woman. <laughs> like Bahati. Uh, what is it about? Oh, it's, it's, a, it's a story. It's a story about uh, Juju. Oh. Okay, I'm not talking about voodoo, that's just something else. I'm not talking about Palo, I'm talking about Juju. In, in Ghana, which is where some of this takes place, a man came to me one day and said, Mr. O'Day, they call me O'Day. I want you to help me do something. I want to get another car and I want to get another wife. He was running a little business. Car first, then another wife. His business was a little shop, and you know, I, I can't help you because I'm receiving money by mail and I don't know when my money is coming. So he got together with the Juju man. What you do is make, uh, you make a, not a net ball, not a sacrifice. You make a deal with, I guess you would call him Satan. They don't call him Satan in Africa. There is no Satan in Africa. We found Satan here. His name is the white man. Over in Africa, <laughs> over in Africa, Satan is something else. Uh, made a deal was what you could do is get a, a black, a black cat's head, some jellied rat's tails, a, a, a bat bone, different items, a, a new, a new, a newly cremated uh, person or whatever it is. And you know, this is supposed to mean something. I don't know about what it means, but in this case, the man who wanted 
these things, who wanted this car and another wife and so forth and so on. While in heaven, what he wanted, someone goes into a shop one day and found him pulling money out of the snake's mouth. The snake was coiled up in a chair, and he's reaching the mouth, taking money out. They had it in the newspapers. So whether the story is true or not, or somebody invented it just for a newspaper story, I don't know. But the snake doctor tells a story of what happens when someone is able to use supernatural powers to gain what they want. You'd have to read it. Incidentally, if you would like to have any of these books, Google my name and go to Amazon.com. That's what it's about. Uh, I've been interested in the bullfight for many years. Uh, I, don't, I don't like it. I just know something about it. I've come to the conclusion after many years that it's animal torture. Mm -hmm. And I can't, I can't suggest that everybody go to the bullfight. I'm taking my wife to the bullfights, and she happens to like it so far, and I don't know how I'm going to get away from that because I'm guilty than, of it. It's more than a bullfight. I'm guilty, story. I did it, and I wish I hadn't done it. But it's more than a bullfight, it's a love story. I'll get to you in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> the name, the title of the book is Matador Negro Azucar. For those of you who don't speak Spanish, it means the black matador sugar. And I named it Sugar because so many great athletes in our culture have been named Sugar. Sugar Ray Robinson, Sugar Ray Leonard, Sugar this, Sugar. I even know a woman named Sugar Ray. Sugar Ray. I'm sorry, Sugar Mama. Sugar Mama. We should write a story about it. A bullfight fan, a bullfight fan who happens to be a bullfighter. Uh, read the book, the guy was suffering from eye problems, and he read the book. Yeah. And he said, hey, there's, there's a lot in it, but it's not, it's not big enough. It doesn't have enough in it. So I had the nerve to come up with Asukar 2, which, <laughs> which fulfills everything that was in Asukar 1. Those are the books. I'm going to read you a short story that come from a series of short stories about uh, a guy who's in trouble. He, I'm a vet, I'm a disabled vet. And uh, they have a lot of disabled vets running around these days. People from the Korean War, from the Vietnam War, and as we will soon see, people from Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, when they come back, they think that they will have a better life. They might be able to get a better job, or they might have benefits and so forth and so on. But as, as you know, a lot of them are living on 4th or 5th in San Julian. If you go downtown, there's not just one skid row, there's a series of skid yeah. rows. Anybody been to skid row lately? You know what I'm talking about. They're living in tents, they're living, uh, they're living on cardboard, on sidewalks, and so forth. What I did in this series of stories, this short, what I've done in this, in this, this particular story is to uh, magnify the problems that many of these veterans are having by focusing on one. This particular guy is called Liquor Store Rufus because that's where he hangs out. Uh, hey, Irene! Irene! Ah, oh, so that's where you go at, huh? You're gonna cross the other side of the street so you won't have to say good morning to your old friend Rufus. <laughs> 